thank you for everybody who's come and uh, welcome to some uh, some of uh, Laurie's friends from the SA Skeptics. And uh, I actually used to attend the Skeptics myself when uh, Laurie was uh, leading it uh, many years ago. Uh, when uh, Laurie used to organise public meetings and they'll organise and have guest speakers. Uh, but since that time, they've kind of changed their format and just meet together in a pub. Um, anyway, um, Laurie is, uh, I'll go off on memory, you can correct me if I get you wrong. Um, before Laurie retired, he was a psychologist and he, uh, he worked within the prison system, didn't you? Uh, yeah, not as a psychologist, no. Yeah, in the prison system. Uh, Laurie is the co-founder of the South Australian Skeptics um, and he currently is writing the investigative magazine Um, so Laurie is going to uh, talk to us today on his version of the true origins of Christianity. And um, he's a very brave man coming here talking uh, on behalf of a minority group on this occasion. And I'd like to warn you that uh, we've burnt people for lesser sins than what we've done. So, um, but, so I commend you on your courage and uh, thank you for actually uh, coming here to address us tonight. And I hope you enjoy this meeting because if he makes his case, this is our last meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you very much, Laurie, and we look forward to hearing what you say. Thank you, Kevin. Yes, I, I've uh, found myself in hot water on a couple of occasions. Uh, uh, I once uh, stood up at a theosophical meeting and disagreed with the speaker and I thought I was going to be lynched, but anyway, I'm used to that sort of thing. So if you could hold all questions until I finish the presentation, thank you. Now, uh, it's been my observation that most people, especially Christians, are quite ignorant of the conditions which actually led to the emergence of Christianity. Most believe that Christianity evolved in the following way, that Jesus taught certain things to the Jews, attracted a number of followers, then after his crucifixion, his followers continued to spread his teachings, then Paul came along, took these teachings to the Gentiles, and eventually these became Christianity. Now, the, uh, the Catholic Church says that, that the inspiration of the Holy Spirit has preserved the message of Jesus intact through all its transition, uh, transmission in the Christian community. So how many of you believe this is how Christianity evolved? Just put your hands up. Sorry? Roughly. Roughly, yeah. Well, how many of you think this approximately how it... All right, a, a large number of you. All right, well, I'm sorry to tell you you're all wrong. <laughs> that is not how Christianity began. The actual origins are much more complex. Um, uh, but that's left us with the... Uh, the idea that many Christians today believe their faith is based on the teachings of Jesus and some people even believe Jesus was the first Christian. They're all wrong. Christianity was the creation of Paul and it had absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the teachings of Jesus or the Jews. According to Maccabee, Paul, not Jesus, was the founder of Christianity as a new religion which developed away from Judaism and the Nazarene variety of Judaism. The Nazarenes, of course, were the followers of Jesus. So it's very important to understand that Christianity did not exist during the lifetime of Jesus. 
it only came into existence after his death. Jesus and his followers were never Christians. They remained loyal Jews. They worshipped in the temple and they observed Jewish law. So we have to ask, how did Christianity evolve? There are some that say that Jesus never existed, that he was actually a mythical figure. And the most powerful argument is that um, this mythical figure was based on Horus, the Egyptian god. Well, um, I disagree with that. I, I actually do believe that Jesus did exist and that there was an actual historical Jesus. Uh, according to Cook, there was an actual historical Jesus. But as regards his life and utterances, there's considerable variation of opinion. Now, he was born at an unknown date in Nazareth, not Bethlehem, and because of his birthplace, he became known as Jesus of Nazareth, or Jesus the Nazarene. According to Barnes, the birth of Jesus, this is the, the gospel account, cannot be regarded as historical. It would appear almost certainly that he was born at Nazareth. Now there was nothing remarkable about his birth. It was just another Jewish child. His mother may have been called Mary. Uh, Joseph was probably his father. It was certainly not the Holy Ghost. He had, to, as far as we know, a quite uneventful childhood. And he was one of at least seven children in the family, four other brothers and at least two sisters. There might have been more, we, we don't know. But, uh, so there were at least seven children in the family. According to Asimov, he presumably was an obscure Galilean until his preaching made him famous. The details of his birth and childhood were not known and this is why we find that the first gospel, Mark, has nothing, no mention whatsoever about his birth and childhood but rather begins with his appearance as an adult. Now, in ancient societies, it was common that adulthood began at about 12 or 13 years of age. Although what was called full adulthood did not occur until 30 years of age. And significantly, Jesus begins his, mess, his mission in the year 29 AD. According to Luke, he began his mission in the 15th year of Tiberius, which was 29 AD. And given the uncertainty as to his birth, we, the time, we can assume that he was at least 30 years of age. Because for the Jews, this was when a, a person reached a man's estate. He attracted followers primarily from the common people and formed what it was in effect a Jewish apocalyptic sect. Does anybody know how many followers they had? You're right, yeah, give the man a, 
an award, 120. It's mentioned in Acts 1.15 that after the crucifixion there were about 120 followers. So it was, it was always a small group. Now, the message that Jesus had was that the day of the Lord and the kingdom of God were approaching very quickly. And he was telling his fellow Jews, you've got to be prepared for this event. Now, the day of the, the Lord was quite a significant event for the Jews because they had been oppressed for centuries and they believed that one day God was going to reclaim his kingdom on earth and at that time the day of the Lord the Messiah would lead his fellow Jews against the oppressors who at that time were the Romans they believed that when that happened God would send down legions of angels and they would sweep the earthly forces away. Nothing could stand in their way. And it would be a time of great glory for Jews and Jerusalem, the, the Israelites. They had these great ideas that they would get their revenge on the Romans for all the hardships and oppression that they'd suffered. And they saw themselves as being the rulers of the earth. Now, this would be when they would inaugurate the kingdom of heaven for Yahweh's elected people, the Jews. Now, the message was for the Jews alone. It had no relevance to anyone else, the Greeks or the Romans. It was for the Jews. So it was certainly not for the Gentiles. And in Matthew, according to, if we can believe it, and I have my doubts, uh, Jesus said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In other words, this message is not for the Gentiles, it's for the Jews only. Now, the Romans weren't too keen on anyone who promised a new kingdom because to do that, you would have to first get rid of the Romans. And they considered anybody preaching this message to be guilty of sedition. Sedition, conduct or speech inciting people to rebel against the autonomy of the state or a monarch. And because this is what Jesus was preaching, he was arrested for sedition. Not for blasphemy or anything else. And he was brought before Lucius Pontius Pilate, the Roman prefect of Judea. Now, the image we have in the Bible, the Gospels, of Pilate was that he was a pretty good guy. And he was prepared to go out of his way to spare Jesus from death. And he pleaded with the Jews to let him off. But they wouldn't have anything of it. And in the end, because, according to gospel, he felt it was unjust to sacrifice, to sentence Jesus to death, he washes his hands, which is symbolic of cleansing his guilt. And according to the Catholic Encyclopedia, he was a worldly man. He knew right and he was anxious to do it. And he would gladly have acquitted Jesus 
and even made serious efforts in that direction. What a great guy he was. So what do the other people, his contemporaries, say of him? Philo of Alexandria. Um, a, a Jewish historian at the time describes him as vicious, despotic, with no respect for the Jews or their customs or their religion. He was vindictive, had a furious temper, was self-willed and inflexible. So that's really the real Pilate. Now, Pilate was in a bit of a delicate position because he'd done a lot of nasty things which had upset a lot of people and he was afraid of this news getting back to Tiberius. So he would never have compounded that by freeing a rebel like Jesus. So we have to ask the question, what did Hitler, Osama bin Laden and Jesus all have in common? No bodies, no graves. The officials made sure their bodies were gotten rid of so that they could not become a source of worship. Now, Pilate would never have risked giving his body, Jesus' body, to his followers because if he had been placed in a tomb, it would have become a place of worship for the Jews for hundreds of years. How do we know that? Well, the Samuel the prophet who lived 835 to 887 BCE and the great rabbi Yehudi Hanosi who lived 135 to 290 AD, their tombs are still visited by worshippers to this day. So Samuel the prophet, well, what's that? Two th almost 3,000 years they've been visiting his tomb. So that's what would have happened with Jesus. So what actually happened to Jesus? Well, the normal custom was to leave the crucified on the cross for a number of days to allow the carrion animals to get at them. And when the stench became unbearable, they were taken, still attached to their cross, and dumped in the Hinnon Valley. Hinnon, um, or known as Gehenna, the Valley of the Sons of Hinnon, was a small valley south of Jerusalem. It became the common lay still or the garbage dump of the city where the dead bodies of criminals and animals and every other type of filth was cast. Now, it's interesting that Gehenna forms the source of the Christian concept of hell, the fires of hell, because Gehenna, the, the fires in this dump were kept going by the use of brimstone or sodium. And we have to say, well, hang on, if Jesus didn't end up in Gehenna, if, as the Bible says, his body was taken away to a tomb, why do the Christians have this concept of hell associated with Gehenna? So, what happened was Jesus was crucified and that should have been the end of it. However, a series of unusual events occurred after his death. And without those events, Christianity would never have evolved. 
Now I can't go into a lot of detail here, but briefly, I like this quote by uh, James Thurber. Hundreds of hysterical persons must confuse this phenomena with messages from the beyond and take their glory to the bishop rather than to the eye doctor. And this is apparently what happened, that some of his Jesus' followers on the road to Emmaus claimed to have seen Jesus, or well, they thought they saw a figure in the dusk. And they reported back to the disciples in Jerusalem that Jesus, they had seen Jesus. Now, you have to understand the disciples and the other followers had all these expectations that Jesus had promised them. They were expecting the glorious kingdom of God to come and they would be sitting at the right hand of God and in positions of authority. Then all of a sudden, their hopes were dashed. And they were in this difficult situation. They were trying to make sense of all these things. Why hadn't these events happened? And they went through a process which is called cognitive dissonance. And if you're interested in it, there's a book called When Prophecy Fails. And one of the ways that people in this situation reconcile their problems is that they rationalise. And what they did is they said, well, if these people had seen Jesus alive, then he must have been resurrected. Now, the resurrection concept was quite popular with the Jews, especially with the Pharisees. This is just an example of one of their quotes from uh, books of the Sanhedrin. It was argued that if a grain of wheat buried naked sprouts forth in many robes, how much more so the righteous. In other words, if a grain of wheat is planted, it is resurrected, and in the same way, that's what happens to humans. Now, we're all familiar with the resurrection concept. How many thousands of people have seen Elvis after he died? It's quite incredible, the number that have seen Elvis. Now, even though the Gospels seem to indicate that the followers of Jesus were, um, didn't get on with the Pharisees, they did appear to agree on this concept of the resurrection of the dead. In Acts it says, For the Sadducees say, there is no resurrection, nor angels, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. Now, the idea of resurrection was based on the Egyptian myth of Osiris. And according to that myth, the dead body was recovered and reanimated. So, these myths of resurrection were quite common in ancient times. Um, we find that all of the deities, Addis, Dionysus, Osiris, Persephone, etc., etc., even the Emperor Nero were all claimed to have been resurrected. It's reported that when Nero was on his funeral pyre, a number of witnesses said they saw his soul ascending into heaven in the form of an eagle. So, although for the Jews the concept of a dead Messiah was inconceivable, the Nazarenes started to find evidence to support their theory that Jesus had had to suffer and die before 
he could come back and bring in the kingdom. And they rationalised that he would soon return physically and would fulfil all the promises he made. Now, unfortunately, despite this belief, they were soon to be turfed out and disappear completely from history. Can I get some more water, please? Thirsty work. The demise of the Nazarenes began with the arrival of Saul of Tarsus, and I describe him as enigmatic type person because he was a really complicated character. Thank you. Just put it there. According to Howard Fast, one of the most remarkable men in history, and if we do not accept the divinity of Jesus, he was the creator of Christianity and the Christian church. Paul was an outstanding Jewish scholar. Now the Jewish scholars were renowned in the ancient world for their learning. It was said the Jewish scholars could argue a point and they could find 100 points in favour of their argument and they could find 100 points in dispute. So they were taught to argue both sides. And Paul lived at a time when there were a number of competing ideologies and philosophies and the, Greek, and the Jewish scholars were taught to argue from both sides so they had to be aware of the opposition and Paul was born in Tarsus which was a centre for the worship of Mithra, Dionysus it was also a stronghold of Stoicism and Gnosticism. Now, what a lot of people don't understand is that most of the ancient religions had an undercurrent, very powerful undercurrent of magic and mysticism. Um, and it was very powerful amongst the Jews. And one of the most important areas in all magic are what is known as the names of power. Now, it was believed that everyone, humans, gods and demons, had a secret name. And if you could find that secret name, you had power over that being. And all these books of magic were designed to tell people the secret names of the demons and how to call them up and control them because they were dangerous. Now, we find in, in Exodus when Moses asks God, what is your name? He's saying, what is your real name? secret name. God won't tell him. What he says, I am who I am. So he's not revealing his secret name because if he had, Moses would have had incredible power. If you had the name of the being, you had the same power as him. And there's a very popular uh, Jewish myth about a creature called the golem which preceded Frankenstein by about four or five hundred years. It's said that a Jewish rabbi created this man out of clay and on his forehead he wrote the secret name of God and immediately the clay became alive 
and it became a living being who became the servant of the rabbi. Um, the story goes, he gets out of control and in the end they have to wipe the name off his forehead and immediately he collapses in a heap of clay. But that was the power of these secret names. And we find Paul speaking about this secret names. He says in Philippians... God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every other name. And whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Can you complete that verse of Philippians? Sorry, I, I haven't got the... F- I'm sorry, mm. Yeah. You go back to it. <laughs> Yeah, it says, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him. Yeah. The name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. That's so right. That's yeah. Jesus. Which is referring to this idea of the name of power. Anyway, um, in the epistles, Paul uses the terms the name of Jesus seven times, the name of Lord name of Lord Jesus, etc, etc. So he's constantly bringing up this idea of how powerful the name of Jesus is. Now, this brings us to Paul's conversion. There have been all sorts of theories as to whether it was an epileptic fit or whatever. My personal belief is he had a a nervous breakdown due to a massive guilt complex. However, that's my opinion. Now, um, Waynesborough says his conversion was the result of a miraculous vision. Um, Paul himself says, far more simply, God called me through his grace and chose to reveal his son in me. Now, we first hear of Paul, or Saul as he was, in Acts 7, 58, where it's mentioned that he he holds the robes of the people stoning Stephen. Now, this creates all sorts of problems because as Stephen is dying he calls out Lord Jesus receive my spirit now for the Jews the term Lord was used to refer to one person only God you did not use it to refer to a man now the fact that Stephen is apparently using this terminology this early in the piece creates all sorts of problems because the term Lord Jesus was something preached by Paul and it was still 15 or 20 years in the future so how did Paul, um, Stephen how was he able to use this term Well, he was either a time traveller or the whole story was a piece of fiction. Now, the problem continues. Um, The whole story of Paul going to Damascus, he was going to round up the followers of Jesus and bring them back to Jerusalem. But... Why go to Damascus? Because the centre of the movement was Jerusalem, where the disciples were and most of their followers. So it just doesn't make sense that he would go all the way to Damascus. And there are a few other inconsistencies, but anyway. What happened after 
he left Damascus is uncertain. We have different versions. According to Acts, his disciples, and that his disciples worries me because Paul apparently was only in Damascus a short time, but this seems to indicate he'd already gathered disciples. Anyway, he's let down over the wall and he escapes from Damascus. And according to this, he then went to Jerusalem where he tried to contact Peter and the disciples, but they were afraid of him because they didn't think he was genuine. Paul, on the other hand, says, I did not go up to Jerusalem, but I went away into Arabia, and again I came back to Damascus. Then after three years, I finally, he goes up to Jerusalem. Different, wholly different story. Now, the term, I went away into Arabia is interesting because in ancient times, if you had a problem and you were trying to sort things out, you went into the desert, away from the distractions of the city, and you communed with God and you sorted out your ideas. And this is apparently what Paul is saying, is he went away into the desert. Why? Probably to sort things out. Then he comes back and he begins to preach and he refers to my gospel on a number of occasions. Now his message was quite different from what the Nazarenes were teaching. He had, his teachings had two primary aspects. The first one was the existence of a transcendental being, the Christos, who would bring salvation to all believers. And according to Maccabee, the central myth of the new religion was that of an atoning death of a divine being. Paul derived this religion from Hellenic sources, chiefly by a fusion of concepts from Gnosticism and concepts from the mystery religions. The second aspect that Paul was teaching was of an eternal cosmic duel between the forces of good and evil, which predated the creation of the universe. Um, according to Fast, underlying most of his thinking was a concept very much like the ancient dualism of the Persians, an endless struggle between light and darkness, a view which Judaism had abandoned centuries before. Now, in this cosmic struggle, God represented the powers of good and light. The dark forces were represented by beings called archons and Paul describes them in Ephesians as spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now the Nazarenes had nothing to do with this. They were remained faithful to the Judaic teachings. The only addition was they believed Jesus was the Messiah who would soon come back and restore sovereign power to Israel. The Jew, to the Jews, the Messiah was always a human being. He was not, never was anything supernatural and that's according to the Encyclopedia of Judea. Paul, on the other hand, replaced the mortal Jewish Messiah with this divine being, the saviour of all humanity, Jesus Christ. 
Paul claimed Jesus was not only the son of God but he was a God in his own right and in Hebrews he's talking about God saying of the son he says thy throne O God in other words God is saying, talking about Jesus calls him a God and as a God Jesus could grant salvation and in Acts it says there is salvation and no no one else for there's no other name under heaven now to the monotheistic Jews these ideas were not only alien they were quite abhorrent it was sort of like tossing a, a pork pie into a synagogue so Paul's gospel was not for the Jews it was for the Gentiles and his concepts were based essentially upon Gnostic teachings. The Gnostics were a number of mystery groups that predated Christianity and the, their objective was to gain Gnosis or wisdom which would enable them to reach heaven and salvation. Quite, quite a complex um, process. The set, the, there were seven spheres that you had to ascend through to reach uh, heaven. Now Paul speaks about a mystery, a secret knowledge which was hidden from humanity, which was kept secret for a long time. The, this mystery was a Gnostic conspiracy theory about this struggle between good and evil. And he refers to these evil powers as rulers of this age. However, he's not speaking about the Roman or Jewish rulers. What he's talking about were the elemental spirits of the universe the prince of the power of the air, the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, this is a quote from Brandon. In the original Greek, the words denote the demonic powers believed to govern the present world order. And their use in this passage reveals that Paul was thinking in terms of current Greek or Roman astralism. Sorry, what is astralism? Um, it's a sort of a like an astrology with magic and a few other things thrown in. So basically it's the idea that there is a, a world out there governed by spirits and the spirits are in charge of the various planets. Each planet had a, a spirit anyway um, and the earth itself was under the domain of a particular spirit uh, creator the demiurge but uh, I won't go into too much detail but basically what Paul is saying we are wrestling not against flesh and blood not against the physical rulers but against principalities powers against the rulers of the darkness of the world against spiritual wickedness in high places now what Paul says is this mystery was made to, known to me by revelation so essentially what he's saying was that when he had this episode on the road to Damascus he had a revelation where God revealed to him a great cosmic plan for human redemption where God would allow his son the Christ to be killed by these evil powers and by killing the Christos who had agreed to this plan 
the evil powers would be tricked into believing they'd won a victory. However, this was simply a plan to trick these evil powers. For none of the rulers of the age understood this, for if they had, they would have not, have not have crucified the Lord of glory. So Paul is relying very heavily on Gnostic concepts. The Gnostic salvationist ideas were adopted by him as the gospel of your salvation. And my gospel his gospel replaced the Pharisaic concept of doing good and all you had to do in this new ideology was to believe in Jesus and you would be guaranteed salvation. Now this salvation was a secret and hidden wisdom which God had decreed before the ages and Paul believed God would reveal this gnosis to all who believed in his son, the Christ. And there are a number of passages, I won't read them all. Um, believers would be granted full wisdom and insight. So what Paul is saying, the believers will receive this wisdom, but for the unbelievers, this message would be hidden from them. He says our gospel is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this world, the demiurge, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel. So throughout the epistles, Paul is using Gnostic terminology. Um, he uses the term wisdom 12 times, the wisdom of God three times, etc, etc. So he's saying that believers will receive this wisdom. For one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to others the utterance of knowledge. He has made known to us in, this, in all wisdom and insight the mystery of his will. And so it goes on and on. Now, this was the message that Paul brought to the Gentile world. And while the, the original followers of Jesus remained in Jerusalem, Paul started on his missionary journeys spreading this message. Now, the Roman world was rather unique. It was one of the first slave economies. The, the whole Roman Empire was dominated by slavery. The, it's estimated there were about 60 million inhabitants in the Roman Empire and 10% of them were slaves. In Rome itself, which was the first city in the world to have a population of over a million, it's been estimated that 40 to 50 percent of that population were actually slaves. And the problem was that when you had a slave economy, it was difficult for ordinary people to get work because if you look at the Victorian era where the working class provided the servants and the farm labourers and for the rich people, in the Roman Empire that didn't happen because all that manual work was done by slaves. So there wasn't the opportunity for common people to earn a living. 
and um, the the Romans started off originally as farmers then they started invading their neighbours land and they found they were more successful at stealing land than farming so they kept on doing that and they eventually built an empire and in, at the time of Jesus there was some 600 aristocrats that ruled the Roman Empire these were the senators and the generals people like Cassius they equivalent wealth you'd have to compare them with Bill Gates these people were mega wealthy below them was 300,000 what we call lower aristocrats these were the knights that were the governors of the provinces and did all the administration so there was a large number of ordinary people in the Roman Empire and the aristocrats looked down upon them in the words of Cicero the work of all artisans is sordid there can be nothing honorable in a workshop in other words these people are not worth considering now the ordinary people wanted salvation just as much as the, the rich but it was difficult because this, the religious system of the time was set up to cater for the wealthy if you were a member of a religion you were expected to make large contributions to the temples and to the priests the various ceremonial technical processes that they had in these various religions required expensive costumes to be inducted into the order it was a bit like the, the Masonic order you had to go through rituals and that involved paying people to perform the ritual so it was only the rich that could get religion the rest of the ordinary people they hadn't a hope in Hades sorry sorry soldiers same thing most of the soldiers followed Mithra anyway all of a sudden Paul comes along and says I've got this new religion and it doesn't matter if you're poor or a slave you're welcome in fact we don't despise common people and artisans because our saviour God himself was a humble carpenter so what do you think people felt naturally they were attracted to the new religion and as they started to pour in to this new church originally they worshipped in the Jewish synagogues but very soon they started to split away because they were bringing in a lot of ideas which were antagonistic to the Jews because they had all these beliefs from their previous religions for instance they believed in deities and aeons and all sorts of things angels and, and these pagan ideas started to infiltrate the new religion and according to Massey Christ was made up from the features of all these various gods what happened uh, for instance in those days in if you were a shopkeeper you working in the bazaars and you had a quiet day you'd be talking to your neighbor and 
uh, or else after your day's work was over, you'd be in the tavern and having a few wines and you'd be talking about the various things. In those days it was, who's the latest gladiator? And uh, invariably talk turned to religion. And invariably someone would say, oh yes, my son recently had a terrible fever and he was, we thought he would die. So I made a sacrifice to Asclepius and miraculously within a day my son recovered and the Christians are sitting there, oh yeah, yeah, but Jesus could heal the sick too and he could uh, cure the lame. He could even raise the dead. It was one-upmanship. Anything their gods could do, Jesus could do better. And the early Christians were pretty hot on. They gained a bad reputation. What used to happen would be if somebody came up to buy some goods from them, if it was a Christian shopkeeper, he'd serve them and then say, and incidentally, who do you believe? Who is your, the God you worship? And if you said, oh, yes, well, I worship uh, Apollo or whoever it was, the shopkeeper would harangue him and said, oh, brother, you're missing out. You've got to... Listen, I've got the goods on this great new God, Jesus Christ. And uh, apparently these arguments became quite heated. But as if that wasn't bad enough, the worst was reserved for other Christians if they said, oh yes, I worship, I follow the teachings of Serinthus or one of the other early break-off um, Christians. And it was reported that often these arguments would become so heated they would actually end up in physical attacks where the, the shopkeeper would lay in to the, the, this other person. Sorry, what era are you referring to? I'm talking about we're talking about 50, 60 AD. Sorry, I can't hear who's talking. Oh, yeah, sorry, it's you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. We're, still, we're still talking about the 50s. Right. Where did you get that information from? Oh, God, don't ask me. I've, <laughs> I, I've, I've read so many books over the years. Um, most of this stuff I did 30 or 40 years ago and then moved on to other things. Anyway, um, the, uh, we have some indication from the Gospel that there was a, a bit of antagonism between Paul and the Nazarenes. And Paul mentions a couple of times a warning about people that preach another Jesus. And although we're not sure exactly if he's referring to the Nazarenes, the, it appears that that's what he's talking about. Anyway, so we're still in the 50s. Uh, I think Paul died about 56 AD, thereabouts, they're not sure. Now, the, these early... Christians were known by various names. They were known as the brethren, the faithful, the elect, saints, believers. And finally in Antioch, for the first time, they were called Christians. And it was the, the, the objective of the name was an insult. It was a bit like uh, in later years when people attacked one group and called them Quakers or Methodists. These were insulting names, but the people ignored that and they adopted that name and so they became known as Christians. Um, 
Now, it seems that the, the disciples and the, the others in Jerusalem were completely unaware of what was really going on. Because in around 50 AD, they had the first council in Jerusalem. And all they were concerned with was not these heretical teachings, but they were concerned about, well, if somebody comes in who's a Gentile and hasn't been circumcised, should they be circumcised, etc. And eventually they came down with the edict. Well, the main thing is abstain from pollutions of idols and, its, and chastity and etc. So that's all they were concerned with. They didn't seem to know what was really going on. And I think Paul made a point of keeping them ignorant. Now, in this struggle between Paul and the Nazarenes, things were leading up to a climax. And the climax came in 66 AD. Now what happened was that the Jews revolted against the harsh taxation from the Romans and the local prefect Florus he marched into the temple and stole a large amount of silver from the Jewish temple and I mean that was the the worst thing you could do to a Jew is to insult and steal from the temple. The Jews rioted and they wiped out the local garrison, the fortress Antonio, which was, I'll show you later, was attached to the temple. Had a garrison of 300 soldiers. Now, what happened was that when word of this got out to Syria, the local legate, Cestius Galius led a, a number of legions to, uh, to Jerusalem. They were attacked by the zealots and they were wiped out. They reckon about 6,000 Roman soldiers. Worse still, the Jews got hold of the Imperial Eagle, the standard of the legion, which was the most devastating insult to any Roman. Anyway, this began the Roman, Jewish Roman War, and it led to a four year siege on Jerusalem by Titus. Now, according to the, the book of Acts, the disciples had been told. Do not depart from Jerusalem, but to wait there for the return of Jesus. So it would appear most of the, the Nazarenes were in Jerusalem. Now, when the Romans... Just a sec. That was a long time before. Yeah. Sorry? That, that, that uh, Bible quote is not related to what you're talking about now. Hang on, it is. The Romans do not do things by half measure. When they attacked Jerusalem, they couldn't breach the walls. So what they did is they dug a trench all the way around the city. And they heaped the earth up, according to Josephus, the earth was heaped up as high as the walls of Jerusalem and they patrolled the trench and any, anyone caught trying to escape from Jerusalem was grabbed and crucified on top of this wall of dirt and according to various historians up to 500 Jews a day were being crucified on this pile of dirt. 
so given that this went on for four years you can imagine what it did to the population of Jerusalem anyway eventually the Romans breached the walls invaded the city killed most of the inhabitants those they didn't kill were taken into slavery which was the common practice in those days they killed the old and the young those fit for work up to 500, 500 yeah. well, not 500 every day but up to and that's according to Josephus up to 500 a day, a day. Yeah. and they did that for four years for four years oh god oh. Anyway, let me continue. And they completely raised the temple. Now, according to Eusebius, one of the early church fathers, after this war, the remnant of the Jewish Christians fled to a town called Pella, which was up there. Now, that's we really don't know what happened. Uh, that could have happened, but they actually fled. They actually fled before, uh, before the Jewish war. They went to Galilee. Yeah. Um, anyway, that's according to Eusebius that they. That's where they ended up. Went, yeah, that's, that's true. That's where they ended up. Yeah. They, they went to Pella prior to the uh, Jewish war in response to the death of James because the. Uh, the high priest uh, ordered uh, James yeah. to execute. Yeah, yeah, so. So they're out before the Jewish war. Yeah. Can I have some more water? I've just spilled mine. I have got so excited. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so as far as we know, the, the f disciples and the other Nazarenes were wiped out or disappeared to Pella perhaps and it left the situation where there was no, no opposition to Paul and the Gentiles I think by this time Paul was, was dead but the Gentile church had no opposition and as Hitler, uh, Winston Churchill said history is written by the victors and with all opposition gone the Jewish the uh, Gentiles were free to write their own version of history. How are we going for time? On uh, oh, good. I, I was I was going to try and keep this under an hour. Anyway, the gospel writers removed all references to disputes between Paul and the Nazarenes, and they started to add fictional material to the gospels filled the Gospels with non-Jewish terminology. For instance, they, they have terms like the Christ, the Son of God, and uh, for God so loved the world he gave his only Son. Now, these terms would have made absolutely no sense to the Jews because as far as they were concerned, God could not have a son. God was God and that was it. And as his chosen people, the Jews believed they were all the sons and daughters of Yahweh. So the idea of God having a son didn't make sense. So that terminology suggests the Gospels were written by the Gentiles. Now, the approximate dates of the various Gospels are very approximately uh, first was Mark about 70 AD now with little knowledge of the Jews and their Jewish practices the Gentile authors of the Gospels made a number of glaring errors um, 
Christianity probably began with a different idea of the resurrection. The original version did not require a tomb. It seems that the idea, the story of the tomb, evolved later, probably from Egypt, because the Egyptians believed that the body could only be resurrected from the tomb. It used to take anything up to 70 days to prepare a body for burial. And then when the body was laid in the tomb, that was when it ascended to heaven. Now, we find um, statements, there was a man named Joseph from the town of Arimathea. There is absolutely no record of the town of Arimathea in any Jewish literature. So it would seem he was a fictional character. Um, the Gospels say G uh, Joseph laid Jesus in the tomb and he sealed it with a large stone. Now the Jews did not seal the tombs. They left the tomb open for three days because in those days they were afraid of the premature burial that they might bury someone they thought was dead who was actually still alive. So they left the tomb open for three days. So very unlikely. Who was Jesus' paternal grandfather? Matthew says Jacob. Luke says Heli. According to Bishop Spong, the genealogies in each of the two Gospels are not only different, they're incompatible. The Ten Commandments. It seems Jesus did not know the Ten Commandments. In Mark 10, 19, he cites, do not defraud as a commandment. So either he didn't know the Ten Commandments or this was written by somebody that had no idea. Um, the story of Jesus healing the leper. He come down from the mountain and a leper came up to him. Now, lepers did not wander around the countryside. They, the law, the, the Judaic law said they must live away from civilization. So they didn't go wandering around the, the countryside. Um, the, according to the uh, Luke, there were two high priests at the one time. Nonsense. There was only ever one high priest at a time. Um, various claims he was taken to the home of Caiaphas, another says he was taken to the home of Ananus. All total rubbish. Um, the story about Jesus attacking the moneylenders in the temple, two big problems. The first is the moneylenders did not sell or trade their money in the temple. This was the most sacred part in Jew the Jewish world. The, Jew the, the moneylenders traded in the streets leading to the temple. Hang on, hang on. We can discuss this later. Second point. <laughs> Remember I mentioned the Fortress Antonio. The Fortress Antonio was adjacent to the temple where the Romans could keep a lookout and if there was any disturbances they could send their soldiers in. Incidentally, the temple also had its own police force, a group of soldiers, uh, equivalent of a police force. Now, on certain occasions, like the festivals like the Passover, the governor would come up from Caesarea Maritina to Jerusalem and he'd bring a depart... Is that getting a bit cold, is it? It's all right. And he would bring an extra 3,000 soldiers with him. And they would be stationed in the fortress and they'd patrol the streets up to the temple. So the place was awash with soldiers and temple police. So nobody in their right mind 
would have started attacking the moneylenders. Where was the Sermon on the Mount delivered? Well, he went up, according to Matthew, he went up the hill and in this version he delivers nine Beatitudes. I don't think there be too many Christians. Hang on. In Luke, he came down the hill and stood on the level ground and in this instance he delivers four Beatitudes. Who took Jesus down from the cross? Thank you. Who took Jesus down from the cross? Joseph of Arimathea, according to Luke. According to Acts, the people of Jerusalem. Who's right? Who's wrong? How did Judas die? According to Matthew, he hung himself. According to Acts, he fell down in the field and his bowels gushed out. Inconsistency after inconsistency. The four Gospels cannot be regarded as reliable and factual reports. They were written during the latter half of the first century and they were written to record oral records and to put together ideas that had evolved by this time. And by that time, Jesus had become Christ, the suffering saviour, and so these ideas were written into the Gospels. The Gospels are the work of man who believed they were recording the early life of a divine being. So the Jesus mythos continued to expand after 70 AG, and so filled are the birth stories of Jesus with legendary details that historicity collapses when placed under the microscope of modern scholarship. The birth narratives are all what's called midrash, religious teaching conveyed by poetic fancy and allegory, not sober history. By this time, other ideas were starting to creep into uh, the story of Jesus. We find many of the examples of gods like Horus, who was born on the 25th of December, born of a virgin. When he was born, a star appeared in the east. He was adored by three kings. He was a teacher at 12. He baptised and began his ministry at 30 and had 12 disciples. And uh, some of the titles of um, Christ are also the titles of Horus. They were both the Good Shepherd, the Lamb of God, Bread of Life, Truth and Life, Christ the Lord. Um, the stories of Mithra also began to infiltrate the stories about Jesus. His, um, he was born of a virgin mother in a cave on the 22nd, 23rd of December. His priests were called fathers, his followers, brothers and sisters. Mithra was the bearer of the keys of heaven and he opened the gates of heaven to the faithful. He was put to death wearing a crown of thorns. He was raised after three days in a rock tomb. Don't worry, we're almost there. So the concept of salvation, the saving of the survival in an eternal afterlife is the basis of many religions. Because people had to have hope that their whole life wasn't a waste. There was something came afterwards. Uh, this was the heartfelt plea from in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Let me not be rejected from salvation. They were pleading with the gods to be saved and admitted to the afterlife. So essentially Christianity was salvationism in a new guise and Christianity was a synthesis of primitive superstition, Gnosticism, mysticism, dualism and a few other isms. Sorry? 
statement. Yeah, that's my statement. Right. Christianity, the belief that some cosmic Jewish zombie can take you, make you live forever if you symbolically eat his flesh and telepathically tell him you accept him as your master so he can remove an evil force from your soul that is present in humanity because a red woman was convinced by a talking snake to eat from a magical tree makes perfect sense. <laughs> Sorry, I've gone a bit over time. I had hoped I would do this in under an hour, but uh, I have a tendency to talk so much. So if we'd like to have a break now, and then after a bit of supper, I'll be happy to answer all your questions. All right, that sounds good. We'll have a break. All right. Then we'll resume in ten minutes' time. All right, fine.